Good evening. Good morning. It is our great honor to welcome so many music professionals and decision makers from around the world joining today's edition of Sound Cities from Unit Music Ecosystems. Sound Cities from Unit Music Ecosystems is a global online conference series bringing inspiring voices from the intersection of city planning, music entrepreneurship and cultural agency into the lives of individuals on all continents. By exploring diversities where music has played a strategic role in sustainable urban development, this series develops practical insights into how music can support economically prosperous, vibrant and engaged city ecosystems. Sound Cities is a co-presentation of Resetting the Stage, a global knowledge hub launched in March 2020 by the Global Leaders Program with four partners to shed light on dynamic challenges and opportunities faced by arts sector music professionals. We are thrilled to have you join us today in this special series by participating, exchanging and discussing with a group of invited guests how music infrastructures can drive development in cities and regions. The Global Leaders Program offers an Ivy League curated executive graduate certificate in social entrepreneurship and cultural agency. Each year, 60 music professionals, distinguished by proven accomplishments and a persevering commitment to creating change, become part of an international cohort. Led in partnership with nine top universities, among them Harvard, Duke, Georgetown, NYU and McGill, the Global Leaders Program's faculty includes Nobel Prize recipients, Grammy winners and TED presenters. Sound Diplomacy is the leader of global music ecosystem movement. As strategists for communities of all sizes, developers, foundation, large private sector organizations and governments, Sound Diplomacy provides cutting-edge research and market expertise for robust music and nighttime economy strategies in city, urban and development plans. Sound Diplomacy works in over 40 countries and they also run the global leading series of conferences of music and public policy called Music Cities Events. The David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University, known as DRCLAS, works to increase knowledge of the cultures, economies, histories, environment and contemporary affairs of Latin America. DRCLAS provides resources and support for Harvard faculty doing work related to Latin America and offers a range of programs that bring together scholars, Harvard students and professionals from a wide range of disciplines, allowing for unique cultural and academic exchanges. Cultural Agents is an initiative at Harvard University and a public-facing NGO. Its mission is to provide academics, artists, community leaders and active citizens with a platform to revive a long humanistic tradition that combines arts and research in the service of civic development. By identifying projects that develop socially productive artistic practices as cases for culture, the initiative and the NGO support good leadership for human flourishing. Solar Art Management is an Italian cultural management organization based in Rome that promotes the growth of young musicians and higher education in music, as well as the knowledge and appreciation of diverse musical cultures and their respective educational models and traditions. Today's session is jointly supported by resetting the stage and its partners, including the Spanish Association of Symphony Orchestras, Classical Next, Colombia's Banco de la República, Fundación Bebebua and Fundación Bolívar da Vivienda. Before introducing today's distinguished speakers, I would like to share brief housekeeping requests to help make today's session more interactive and engaging for all of you. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a control panel with the chat. Please go over now and write your name, country of residence and your organization. In the control panel, you will also find a Q&A button. You are encouraged to engage directly with our panelists by posing a question for them in this questions and answers box. Please submit your questions as early as possible as there will be a limit to how many can be answered during the session. Finally, at the close of today's session, you will be prompted to complete a brief survey that will appear on your screens. We kindly ask 
that you share constructive feedback or suggestions for future sessions as we continue to evolve this growing series to address topics and challenges of relevance to all of you working in this sector around the world. And with that, let's get started. Welcome to the fourth edition of Sound Cities, Community Music Ecosystems. It's great to see so many performing arts professionals joining us today from around the world. It is also a distinct honor to welcome today's panelists. Anne Randall is the manager of Creative Cities uh, at Adelaide City Council. She has a background working in arts and cultural leadership positions in South Australia. Anne had a varied career before joining the city of Adelaide, working as a merchant banker in London and a receivership and liquidation tax specialist. After immigrating to Australia, she set up her own database development company and spent some time as a university lecturer before embarking on a career in community, um, in community and culture. Anne is passionate about and excited by arts and lifelong learning and the central role that they play in the community. As Director of Creative Industries at the Department for Innovation and Skills, Beck Bates is responsible for strategies that stimulate growth across creative industries in South Australia. She led the establishment of the state's Music Development Office, MDO, which brought together areas of government to recognize music as an industry. In addition, Beck drove the development of the St. Paul's Creative Center, a precinct to support creative industries. Prior to this, Beck was a partner in a music management company working in career and strategy development, as well as international contract negotiations. Beck Pierce has over 20 years of experience as a creative producer and programmer for arts festivals and arts venues, managing projects across the creative fields of music, dance, and theater, including the conducting of professional residencies in Paris and Singapore. Beck is recipient of an AsiaLink residency with Singapore Arts Festival and recipient of Earth 2020 Women in Music Program and also Helpman Awards Panel Member for Contemporary Music. She is the current director for the Office of Adelaide UNESCO City of Music. She has initiated several collaborative projects and artistic residencies and has been a speaker on several international panels. Before we begin, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator. Dr. Shane Shapiro to set the stage where our discussion begins. Originally from Toronto, Canada, Dr. Shapiro has worked in the music industry for over 15 years. As president of Sound Diplomacy, he has defined a new way to think about the value of music in cities and places and has influenced on the over 100 cities to invest in music and culture. He is also the co-founder of Music Cities Convention, the world's largest event bringing together the music industry of city planners, developers, policymakers and executives. And with that, let's get started. Shane, the floor is yours. Hi, Beck. Hi, Beck. Hi, Anne. How are you guys? Really good. Thanks, Shane. How are you? Good. It's a bit late here, I'm going to be honest, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm caught in the middle of this, uh, this you know, intercontinental conversation, I guess, here in London. But uh, it's, it's an absolute... It's an absolute pleasure to to be able to to hang out with you guys and and see you. It's been a while. Um, I thought that we would, you know, Adelaide has such an incredible story, um, and you know, for for many many years, really looking at how the city, how the you know the business community within the city, um, and the industry has kind of come together, not only through the UNESCO program, but but you know, over many many years and. And for those listeners, um, for those people listening, you know, my introduction to this concept of, I guess, what people call music cities or music city policy was Adelaide. Adelaide was the, was ground zero. And maybe I'll start with you, Beck, because we, we knew each other quite well back then. Can you take me back in time to, what, what was it, 2012, 2013? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what initiated kind of the first thoughts in Adelaide and in South Australia around this topic and and kind of and 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 what and and take us through kind of the um 
you know, initial thinking around the first report, which I, I will talk, talk about. Sure, no problem. So just for context, for those who are unfamiliar with Adelaide, Adelaide's in the um, sort of in the in the, in the middle at the at the bottom of Australia um, in a state called South Australia. So um, we're sort of fairly central on the southern coast, and the music industry, in terms of record labels and the density of of music industry, is on the east coast in cities that you would have heard of, such as Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne. Um, so Adelaide's kind of a regional city. Um, it's one of the smaller ones, one of the more dynamic, I have to say, though. But so uh, a bit of backstory. So um, we were in a government at the time that had a uh, what they called a vibrancy agenda, and it was about making the city more vibrant, uh, recognising that it needs to be a, a livable place, a place uh, young people want to stay um, or come back to. And so we used to have a program called the Thinkers in Residence program, and it was looking at all different topics. So it would be health and wellbeing or early childhood learning. And um, the last of that series was to be a live music thinker in residence um, program. And so uh, we invited Martin Elborn to come to Adelaide as our live music thinker in residence. And what happened then is, is a partnership from within Adelaide across the state government um, and local government and industry to work together um, to, and with Martin to um, explore what we had, what our, what our history was, what our potential was here, and then uh, Martin would come in with a sort of global perspective and offer advice and guidance. And it was a conversation. It, it's, it's one of those conversations you kind of crack open, touch a few nerves, um, have some interesting debates. And out of that came a lengthy report, um, which I suppose was the catalyst for then, um, we used that report to hook in opportunities. So there was a lot of things happening at that time. Um, the arts portfolio, which was funding music simply for arts, um, had um, asked, I was working there at the time, part-time, and they asked me to do an internal review about how we might think of funding music a little differently. And that was happening at the same time as the report was being written. Um, and I think that's when I reached out to you, Shane. I stumbled across something you'd done at, uh, at uh, gosh, where was it? South By or something about music policy. So it was, it was two things happening at the same time. Um, also the city council um, where Anne is currently working, they were doing um, plans at the same time. So it was kind of like this moment in time where there were many, um, people in, of influence um, and, you know, from politics and government with a lot of goodwill um, looking to, to do something in this space. So the report gave us an opportunity to hook into those recommendations and, and really drive that forward. And a lot of, as you know, has come out of that. So, yeah, thank you. And I, I will, uh, to the audience, um, talk a little bit about, more about the report. We can probably dig up a link. I know it's available online still. I still refer to it from time to time, but Beck, can you kind of give, um, you know, kind of give the audience a bit of, of your Adelaide story? I know you're, you're a little bit uh, more recently engaged in, the, in this conversation, but um, kind of, you know, tell us a little bit about, obviously, I know you've been behind and, and working with uh, too many festivals to count and, um, and kind of how you came to this, uh, to this topic and to, and to engaging kind of you know, music policy in Adelaide. Sure, Shane. Look, I um, ha have been part of um, the Adelaide UNESCO City of Music office uh, for the past couple of years. Um, I have been working with the Adelaide Festival Centre um, and was one of their, their managers uh, for their programming department. And the Adelaide Festival Centre, of course, was instrumental in um, applying um, to UNESCO for the city to become a creative city of music. So it led the bid, but working very closely with the City of Adelaide Council and also um, the state government through the Music Development Office. So I came into the picture <laughs> through wearing a couple of different hats and one was with the Adelaide Festival Centre um, as their Associate Director at the time for programming. Um, I have to say, um, within the short period of time, that Adelaide has been part of the network. So back in 2015, 
Adelaide was designated. Um, and back then there were only 11 music cities as part of the network and now there are 47. So it's grown quite quickly. Um, but within that short period of time that Adelaide has been part of the network, it has done a lot. So um, I first joined the team really um, back in 2017. So within the first couple of years, a lot of things had happened. And now um, certainly with the support and leadership of both the city council and the state government, um, and the Adelaide Festival Centre, a lot has been enabled uh, for the city and for the office to really connect um, with, the, with the Creative Cities Network. So um, I have to say the partnership between the Adelaide Festival Centre, the City of Adelaide and um, the state government is quite fantastic. It, it works really well um, to support uh, both the office but also uh, the music sector as a, as a whole. So I think in terms of a leadership point of view, it, that's a fantastic thing for us to be doing. Yeah, and, and so I, I'm trying to approach this kind of conversation linearly uh, or from a time perspective and again, you'll have to bear with me, it's late here. But um, the, the, the report, I remember the report, it's called The Future of Live Music in South Australia. And I wanna spend a little bit more time on that before kind of going into the uh, the current and, and you that came out in 2014, I, I think, or 2013, and UNESCO City of Music uh, was 2015, right? And before I come to Anne, um, kind of Beck, did one lead to another or was it coincidental? Like would, like often, because I say this because often cities will go for a brand before they will do the research. And I feel like Adelaide did the opposite which is what I would advocate for. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious if you can kind of take me back in that time and how some of these decisions were made. And then Anne, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bother you for a little while. Um, Beck, other Beck, do you want me to jump in? Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so I, so um, look at Shane, it was actually, it's probably a little bit about that momentum I spoke about. So there was a lot of research happening um, through the Martin L. Vaughan Life Thinker in Residence program. And then it was, um, you know, when, when something gets momentum and people are getting into it and the conversations heightened about music and the value of music and the cultural value, the economic value, it starts to be, you know, it, it becomes top of mind. And our, our CEO of the, of the Festival Centre that Beck referred to was, was travelling with our arts minister and, and, um, and at the time um, was, was interested in the UNESCO, very, very interested because they do a lot of work, mainly across uh, Asia, and Beck, other Beck can um, speak about that. But um, there was definitely an interest um, for, the, you know, in the UNESCO uh, Creative Cities Network. And so it made sense that for Adelaide's background as well, but but also future facing of where we were going with music here, it made sense that music might be the designation that we strive to um, to secure. And then, um, and the Festival Centre led that as, as Beck said. So let's kind of, I'm gonna move around a bit too. I'm thinking, you know, because it is interesting. And, and one of the challenges that, that a lot of cities face is, um, is you know, when it looks, when it wants to become a music city, that's usually about promoting oneself as a music city. It's not about writing a 140 page report uh, and, um, and, and doing a deep dive into the regulatory infrastructure in Adelaide uh, concerning live music. And kind of, Anne, I know you're a, a little bit newer to this role, even though I know you've been working at the city for a long time. And I'm curious kind of, you know, take, looking back at this and, and where we are now, kind of um, take, take me through your thoughts on, on Adelaide's journey from, you know, that report in 2013 through to the City of Music and, and kind of how you're reflecting back on that today. Um, okay, well, um, before I start, I just want to um, say City of Adelaide acknowledges the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land. We acknowledge that they are the continuing, of a continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nation groups you may be connecting in today. 
So Nina Mani from Adelaide and from the Ghana people who live here. Um, I guess um, the um, UNESCO designation was of terrific significance for the city because what it did was it enabled us to kickstart our entire um, new look at our cultural um, strategy, the way in which we approach culture in the city and actually develop a dedicated team that works on um, promoting the cultural vitality of the city and music within it. Now, we were only able to do that because um, the um, designation acknowledges the existing strengths of music within the city. So um, we've always been a city that has um, a lot of music, but the uh, becoming a UNESCO city of music um, enabled us to look at it in a different way and to focus our, um, our work and our direction. So from a city point of view, we have a um, strategic plan for the city. And that plan has a very strong connection and references the fact that we're in Esco City of Music. In fact, it's one of our highlight areas. We also have a cultural strategy. And within the cultural strategy, um, we have four key streams that we focus on. So it's arts and artisans, festivals, public art, and the fact that we're a UNESCO city of music. Um, our live music action plan, um, we are, we, we're just about at the end of our second live music action plan and are about to start work on developing our, our third plan, which will happen this year. Um, I guess um, we currently have um, a focus of four goals for our live music, um, that the city of Adelaide is a leading global city of music, that the city of Adelaide is activated through music in our places and spaces, and that Adelaide is a music friendly city that nurtures its robust and diverse music industry. And also that we're known for enthusiastic, knowledgeable and engaged music audiences. So can we can we do a bit of a, a you know, again, a, a bit of a deep dive, so to speak, into what music friendly actually means? Um, so, you know, we I, I, there, there's obviously the more that one communicates um, about music being a part of a city, the more people recognize that music is a part of a city. Uh, but I know that, that a lot has been done on the boring stuff, so to speak, that I get excited about. The policy work and the regulatory work in Adelaide. Um, and and Anne or, or, or Beck, I'm, I'm sure, I, I wonder if you can kind of take us through some of these kind of wins over the past few years around, um, you know, reform of, of live music regulation and, and other things that have made Adelaide friendlier. Uh, for, for music and, and what that means to you. Maybe all three of you. Um, um, shall I start, Bex? Uh, yeah. uh, so, so I guess from the city's perspective, um, we see our role with this as being, um, uh, having a leadership role, um, being a service provider. So we provide acoustic services, business information services, and a range of facilitation. Um, we're, but we're also a regulator. So um, we have, um, we operate, offer case management for live music venues to help them navigate um, planning, building and licensing regulations. Um, another role we have is that of being an advocate. So we um, play an active role in live music planning and um, providing opportunities for the music ecosystem to have a voice by offering um, um, workshops, um, places to um, share their views and their ideas. We have things that we call um, culture clubs, for example, where people come together and they can tell us what they think we need, we should be doing. Obviously, we're also a facilitator, so we provide funding and sponsorship for live music um, with the intention of growing all our events. And importantly, we ourselves are an owner of assets. So we facilitate live music in our parklands. We have very extensive parklands here in the city of Adelaide. And um, we operate the Adelaide Town Hall as a key music venue in the city. Um, 
Beck, Bates will probably talk more about it, but I think one of the key things for the city that happened um, was the, um, the um, deregulation that allowed um, the opening of um, small bars in the city because that opened up our laneway. So whilst those bars can't have music in them, what it did was it opened up our laneways and enabled us then to put music on the streets and to bring people into the city. So I don't yeah. know. I yeah. can pick up on that if you like, Shane. So I, th I suppose, um, and again, going back to 2013, it was about how do we recalibrate the current regulatory environment to make it easier for there to be more live music? And it, again, that went to the that government of the times vibrancy agenda. And Anne, as Anne said, um, there was the small bars um, kind of movement. And that what that meant was that it was easy to get a liquor licence and um, and and development approval to open a a small bar up to up to 150 or 200 people. So it was literally tiny, and that's why it was mainly laneways. So so that added to the vibrancy, keeping more people. It was the early evening economy movement. Um, so then what we were doing at the same time was looking at the rest of that regulatory landscape, if you like. What else needed to happen to make it really easy for venues to host music while there were more people in the city? Um, it would create more jobs for musicians and vibrancy and the flow on effects into the economy. And so there was lots of work done, lots of work. So we called a roundtable. We had our National Live Music Office. If anybody knows John Wardle, he's the superman of this space. Um, so they we facilitated a massive roundtable. It was like it had the South Australian police and and um, environment protection, local government, um, you know, the health workers as well as the regulatory. So it was a conversation about what are the risks, how far can we push this, and what's possible to be done. And so it looked at the low risk for um, entertainment because um, there were some ludicrous laws, you know, and over time of liquor licensing, and I could go on forever, but there were things, that, there were bars that had a, a, a liquor licence or an entertainment licence that was so obscure, they could have a, a duo or a five-piece but not a quartet, and it was it was just years of ludicrousy for some reason. So we, the, the major reforms that happened at that time was we removed the need for what was called an entertainment consent, which was a barrier for the timing of which live music could happen. It was a double up that went between um, um, what I understand to be sort of development approvals and liquor licensing. So I'm not a I'm not a real guru on that, but but that was something we we did. Um, and so there was a low impact entertainment, the removal of the entertainment uh, licenses. And um, there was some work done around trading hours as well. So that were the key things. I suppose, you know, looking at it from a macro, that that strategy was let's let's make it as easy as possible, bring the people in the city, make it as easy as possible for culture to happen. And then we created a whole lot of programs and funding mechanisms to support industry and community to fill the space. So that was sort of from the sidelines behind the scenes, if you like, what we were trying to achieve. And I, I think, you know, when we still try to do that, it's not a not something you press end on, you just keep going. But that was that was the strategy. And yeah, and and have you noticed, I guess, you know, what what have the have you noticed outcomes um, from that, even anecdotally? Like back, is it you know, and I'm, I'm talking pre-COVID. We'll deal with COVID in a bit. But, um, you know, from the, um, the regulatory reforms through 2014, I guess, through 2015 and 2016, kind of what difference have you noticed in the city, um, especially as a festival producer? Um, uh, Beck, Beck P, I, I should call it, uh, <laughs> instead of Beck B. <laughs> I have to make sure I, I it's the first panel I've ever been where I've had two Becks. Yeah, but, sorry. Sorry, to, we've confused you. I'm sorry. Um, look, I have to say, um, most recently, the changes that uh, I think I've noticed more from an arts and culture point of view in festivals is um, the engagement from a music point of view with venues. For example, um, the Adelaide Festival Centre has a festival called the Adelaide Guitar Festival, um, where it has a program called Guitars and Bars. So it's an opportunity for artists to perform um, within that festival, but engaging with various venues, um, often for free, but 
uh, for audiences, but it's an opportunity to really celebrate music um, across the period. I think it was in, in August most recently. Um, and another organisation called Music SA has um, a festival called the Umbrella Festival, um, talking pre-COVID, but um, uh, that's an opportunity to celebrate uh, music from South Australia across the city uh, and extending out uh, regionally. Um, but I have to say there's certainly um, uh, more of an, of an engagement uh, across the city, but equally across regionally um, the state um, with, with live music in particular. We, we have seen uh, a, a number of kind of a, a reforms across Australia as well. I always, always say to, to listeners, if, if you wanna, uh, I believe the best country for music policy in terms of trialing, not getting everything right, but getting a lot of things right is Australia. Um, John Wardle, at the live music office, I agree, is uh, is one of the the reasons for that. And I guess um, so. I have to. I've been told again. Um, this isn't about us uh, speaking. This is about you guys listening. So, if you have any questions, I see there are three that have been asked thus far. Please ask them now, and um, we'll start kind of getting to the questions in a little bit. I see someone's raised their hand as well. Um, just ask the question instead of raising your hand. Because I don't know why you would raise your hand without wanting to ask a question. So, um, so let's get into. Um, I, I want to kind of. I want to talk about the, the impact of COVID before we get into kind of the work that you guys are doing now and what you're looking forward to in the future. And you know, how how has I, I know Adelaide, like every other city in the world, has been impacted uh, by by COVID. But and would. Would you argue or do you think that the work that Adelaide has put in over these years, has it lessened the blow a little bit or how has the music sector, not, not just the live music sector, the wider music ecosystem been impacted and, and what have been the uh, initiatives that you guys have, have, uh, have proposed and have um, uh, installed in the city to, to help support musicians in the music ecosystem? Um, I think um, our music eco ecosystem has, has definitely taken a huge hit from COVID, the same as everywhere around the world. However, I think the strong working relationship that we have across state and local government and with the key organisations in the city and being a UNESCO City of Music means that we've been able to work really closely together to make sure that we can support music and musicians as best we can whether that's through introducing new grants programs. Um, and because we've already done the work around introducing case managers and making sure that the process is as simple and straightforward as possible, that's definitely helped. Also, a lot of the programs that we've been working on, we've been actually able to um, work with the organizations because it's very important to us that we work in partnership. So we've been able to work together. So the Umbrella Music Festival, for example, we work to um, turn that into an outdoor festival. We're very fortunate in Adelaide that we've got beautiful parklands. So we were able to put social distancing in place. We were also able to make sure that as things changed, as we went along, we were able to work really quickly to support the artists around and, and the organizations putting the events on around how we can change that. Um, if things needed to be delayed, we made sure that people still got the funding, that um, we were as flexible as possible. We had a um, big pro program that we run that's called Music in Squares. We actually reimagined that as we started opening up from COVID, still at a very limited stage. So we called it Music on the Streets. And so we employed musicians to go onto the streets outside um, cafes and bars and restaurants where people were picking up their coffees or they were starting to be able to go in in small numbers to attract people back onto the streets in a safe way. So I think the key has been that because we have a very good and strong ecosystem and way of working and that we have actually um, consciously endeavoured to make it as simple and straightforward as possible, that's actually supported our musicians and the ecosystem but can't shy away from the fact that we've 
been very impacted the same as everybody else. Yeah, I, and I, I think that, you know, would you, uh, either Beck, um, would you argue that because you're an UNESCO, a UNESCO city of music and you have a music office and you've done research and, and all this work that has happened over the years that it has demonstrably improved the, uh, or maybe assuaged the, uh, the issues that um, local musicians have faced during COVID? Made, made, made. I, yeah. Look, look, I think, um, you know, no amount of planning and policy could have could have helped that really, you know, um, but there were there are people in positions of influence may not have all the power, obviously, that are passionate about this industry and have been there for the duration um, of watching our industry change, grow, you know, move in its in its own forms um, that are dedicated to help it as best they can through times like like COVID, and so um, and you know it's 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 a real thing when when you're watching your your industry colleagues um, fall off the side of a cliff, so to speak, um, and you're sitting in a secure paid job, and I have to acknowledge that it's it's you you become acutely aware of, of your position of of you know. Um, you're not as you know you're, you're more you know what I'm trying to say <laughs> um so yeah so it was it was hard um but look what we did is um you know we obviously have a stream of different support mechanisms and funding programs so we, we pretty much just pulled all of that in we looked at the criteria how can we make this relevant for what people need now musicians and businesses and and got that out into the local industry as quickly as quickly as we could, and so that was to help support um, venues to pay musicians. Um, it was to help support musicians to buy equipment, and and it's something we never used to fund. It was never eligible to purchase equipment, but we 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 changed that because that's what people needed. And so it was about really just responding to what was needed in best we could. We we don't have a, a an infinite budget here it, it's you know we're a small population we don't have huge budgets so it was about making that work as as much as we could and having the biggest impact it could to help you know there, there's you know I have to say um, we've had businesses that have just gone on and, and changed the way they do things get income streams from other areas um, and there's some people that have managed to do that really well there are some that you know that for whatever reason can't um, achieve that that is as effectively um, you know, we've heard positive stories about, you know, some businesses saying, wow, well, if it wasn't for that money that the government pushed into the local industry, it wouldn't have been circulating through our, our recording studios and, and our venues. And, and so that kind of stuff, some people saw that as, as really positive and it had helped them and other people are still struggling. So, you know, it's acknowledging that, you know, you do the best you can and, um, you know, it's, there's, always, there's always more that could be done. Yeah. Shane, I, I, I guess from a, a UNESCO perspective, I think COVID has really highlighted um, to everyone the importance of music, you know, it's and the value of music. It's it's that thing of when you don't have something, it's that's when you appreciate it even more, I think. So to be able to see live performance for so many people and to engage with live performance as a performer, um, it, it's it's been really highlighted during this time and and as you would know um music uh, benefits so many things from a society societal point of view so it's the benefit of health and well-being the benefit of social cohesion um you know the value of of music is, has really it's been crucial um during this time and i think it's 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 kind of given it, it um a greater emphasis yeah, I, I, I agree that, you know, as, as we always say, Joni Mitchell is right. So, you know, you, you, you don't know what you have until it's gone. Um, I, I wonder though, if that actually means that people are going to A, pay more uh, or pay it all or remember any of this once we're out of it. Um, and so I wonder kind of, you know, one thing that I, I feel, I'm curious what your thoughts are is, 
one of the, the successes of the UNESCO program and, and Adelaide, I think you guys are one of the more active cities in the UNESCO program um, of, of all of them is, is the constant kind of hammering in that music matters, right? Yeah, it's, it's, part of, it's part of that, it's part of the psyche. And I am curious if you're, because in Australia, yes, you guys have been able to open up just a little bit uh, where I, I'm in London and we're in, we're, we're in permanent Groundhog Day. Um, but um, I'm curious if you've noticed that at all, if you've noticed kind of, and especially from the Musicians in the Streets program, if you notice that kind of additional appreciation, if, if, you, if you feel positive about the recognition of music in the community and the kind of, not willingness, but the, the desire for the community to engage with it more um, in, in every way. Um, I think um, I can echo what the two Becks have said, that um, the importance of music has definitely come across. Um, the need for music has definitely come across. Um, I think that um, it's, it's really hard when a lot of people are struggling themselves um, with, with um, the need to, um, to have an income. Um, for people to find additional money um, for gigs and things like that. I think it means that we'll be looking at how we do things going forward. But that said, uh, talking to um, Beck Bates um, earlier today, you know, she went out to a concert last night and um, whilst we're in COVID restrictions, it, it was fully, you know, it, it was as many people as could be there were there because people are desperate to actually interact, to engage. Online is wonderful, but I think people are realizing that whilst you can join an online choir, whilst you can sing together, you can in interact like that. The actual physical, personal contact is so important. You know, and music just brings a completely different layer to our entire city and to the feel of the city, how, to, how people feel about living in the city, to walk around and to hear live music on the streets is so important. We, we have a policy that we brought in at the city that all our events that we run, we have to employ a, live, a musician to play live at those events. So it doesn't matter if it's a civic reception, if it's, um, if it's a workshop, if it's a culture club, um, if it's an activation, we have to employ musicians to play at those events. So that, you know, people are getting a different understanding Another example would be within our libraries. We immediately, when we were able to reopen our libraries, one of the first things we did was we brought our music residents back and had music in the li libraries so that people could experience that. So people who perhaps couldn't afford to go, we, would, we are paying for that to happen in our public spaces so that they have that experience because it's so important to the well-being of the individual and to society and to the actual um, the city itself. Yeah, I, I, I love that. We, you know, we've called kind of an artist compensation policy where you know, a city commits to um, hiring and paying musicians in any kind of publicly publicly funded gathering. We, we advocate for every city to do that. I wish, I wish every city did, but, um, but that's, you know, that, that's part of the, part of the objective. Um, so, you know, what are the, looking, looking into the future now, um, you know, and cause we're getting lots of questions. So I wanna, I wanna leave plenty of time to try to get through them. Um, but, you know, what, I, I wanna say kind of, what are the changes that the three of you think um, should be made or could be made? Where, where have you gotten it wrong or what, what mistakes do you feel that you made that COVID may have um, made more apparent? You know, I don't think COVID created anything. It just exacerbated some of the systemic challenges that were existing before that. And, and kind of how, what are you reflecting on now moving into post-COVID planning um, and, and, and resilience in, in the music ecosystem and how you the three of you kind of manage the music policy in Adelaide. I'm put you on the spot to be a little, you know, to tell us the tell us the the challenges as well as the strengths. Look, I think uh, I'll jump in here, guys. If you like, um, I I think um, you know the lesson we learned 
about being instantly responsive to what the industry needs. I mean, we've always tried to do that. Um, and it's not always easy to shift policy and programs quickly. And uh, COVID proved that that can happen. Um, and so I think it's, you know, the lesson is that we need to be, um, you know, I mean, there's always, you're using public money, you have to be a certain amount of risk adverse, but it's about being open uh, to helping and putting um, support mechanisms in place that can actually make a difference. Um, you know, I think other other things are um, some things that I've witnessed is increased collaborations. I mean, we're a small city and we're generally pretty good at collaborating. But the polar to that is that, you know, we have to be competitive too sometimes. So there are businesses that have to compete in a small pond. So it can work either way. But during this time, we've seen music businesses uh, collaborating because it was let's let's do this together and and make some money um, and, and you know, get some good things happening or neither of us are going to be working. And we've seen that happen um, to some really good results. So I think that um, encouraging or facilitating an environment that allows for more collaboration, um, both within our music ecosystem, but within the uh, broader creative ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of value to be found in, in collaborating across creative networks um, within Adelaide, Australia and internationally. Uh, it would be easier to do that when the borders are open. But um, I think that there's, you know, collaboration. For me, it's about facilitating the environment for more collaboration, encouraging more connections and people to think a little differently. So I think there's opportunity in that. Yeah, and I'm curious, Anne and Beck as well, your thoughts, you know, where have you potentially not gotten entirely right in the past and looking to improve as we come out of COVID, whenever that is? I'll just jump in there. I think one of the key learnings um, for us as a city is actually how we use our places and spaces and that, um, you know, music is a very important part of our festival scene as well. Um, but we need to be looking at how we use it in our parklands, what we, how we manage it on our streets, how we work with our incoming community further around the importance of music for the vibrancy of the city. And I think um, we also um, need to understand um, the needs of the musicians um, to um, have a, a bit more ownership in what's happening, I guess. So we've always tried when we put together our live music action plans, we always have a, a, a large uh, component of community engagement. And that's working with the wider community and working with the specifically with the music ecosystem. Um, and I think, you know, going forward, um, it's a really great opportunity for us, as, particularly as a city, as we start developing our next live music action plan, to actually sit down with the musicians and hear what they've learned and what they would like to see um, and make sure that that is incorporated so that they know that they've been heard as we go forward so that we can build on this and the resilience that we found, um, we can say, well, how can we develop that further um, to support the music industry? No, and, and yeah, and Beck, what do you, what do you think, especially yeah. from this perspective as well? Yeah, from, from a UNESCO perspective, I think there are probably a couple of things. Um, one is probably a global issue, which is, um, you know, more time, more money, more resources. Um, but really um, connecting or engaging better with local industry, but also local audiences. So, and when I say that, it's almost, in a way, what Anne has just reflected that how can we better support and and um, promote and collaborate with our local um, musicians here across all genres of music, um, but also um, from the beginning, really helping to create that awareness of. Uh, better create that awareness of music and what the office is about. So what is the designation, how, how it's important to, to the city and to all. Um, so that's probably a, a story that we need to tell a little bit better from the beginning. Um, it, it, is, it is becoming more well known, but it's something that's, it is a slow process. Um, and also another thing which um, has, has really strengthened over the past 
couple of years is signifying the importance of music education and music participation. So from a music education point of view, um, the chair of our office um, was instrumental in developing um, the South Australian music education strategy. So music education is key um, from, you know, from a very young age um, in the school system, as you know, Shane, um, the importance of music and how that can um, assist all forms of learning um, right through to, to adult, an adult age. So they're the sorts of things that I think um, we could potentially work on together with our, as Beck mentioned, our international collaborations and pathways. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious if there's kind of room to, to further engagement now of, you know, going, going on what we said is if the value of music has been reinforced uh, because of all these challenges uh, that we've had over the last year, um, does this give us more opportunity to engage with, you know, non-music entities in Adelaide? And I'm curious kind of if you, maybe back to start, because I, we talked a little bit about this, how you, I know you did at the round tables with the licensing authorities, police, and so on and so forth. How important is it um, to not just engage with, but, but to, to create um, partnerships with, you know, the economic development community, the tourism community, the um, regeneration, the strategic planning community, and, and, and kind of take yep. me through your, your, your collective strategy and how you engage with these uh, external partners. The first thing I'd say is that at the moment here in South Australia, um, we're not allowed to dance, and um, and it's because it's um, it's 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 not it's not safe yet in terms of social distancing, and we follow the rules of our health authority. So that rule is um, it's caused a, a major um, conversation, you might say. And what I'm, the reason I'm raising that is that people that it's that it's that energy that music. Um, brings in humans, you know, the, you want to dance, you want to engage. And last night at, at, I was at this gig and there were people sitting down and moving and dancing, you know. So the, the effects that music have on you, um, we, we all know, you know, the, the benefits of music in health um, and in, in ageing and engaging humans through music is so important. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, this increased... Um, Oh, and also, you know, the gig I was at, there, there was 300 people singing in, in um, Aboriginal language, you know, and it's, it's, it's transformative. It's incredible. And, and so the power of music beyond, um, you know, an economic value is, I mean, everyone here on the call understands that, but it's about how we can help um, deepen that understanding and value and recognition from those who may not have um, had that in the past, and now is the time I think that we should really be moving on on increasing that that recognition um, of that value. And you're right; it's I mean our tourism uh, department here is is active in this space. They are in the conversation through the UNESCO office. Um, they also um, partner with our music development office on our live music events fund. And so tourism is good here, and the education department as well. Uh, and I know that there are elements in our um, in our departments of ageing and uh, looking at this as well. So I think this is a time where we can deepen that and definitely expand on that. So, yeah, I'm curious, Anne, as well, your perspective here as the city. Um, I think um, I, I agree with everything that Beck, that Beck, that Beck said. Um, I think um, there's lots of interesting things that happen and that we need to go to do going forward. Um, I think it's really interesting working with our education sector and um, lots of ideas around how we can get musicians into our, into our nursing homes, into our schools, into our hospitals, so that they are being, A, the musicians are being employed, but also those wellbeing benefits are happening. So it's that conversation that goes across um, um, all our council partners and um, certainly we've just done a big round of cultural strategic partnerships and as part of those partnerships we've been discussing how we can incorporate music into everything that we do into the fabric of the city um, and as I work within council 
because council has a priority on music and sees the economic and social value of music. It is one of our key drivers for the city and that enabled us to make it one of our highlights for our cultural strategy, which is shared across the entire council so that everybody knows that, you know, they need to be talking to us, they need to be thinking about how we can partner, how we can work together. As we start working and bringing in new festivals, we talk to them about what that's going to look like. We ensure that um, local artists are being employed. We're also looking to make sure that um, emerging um, young people have a place where they can come. So making sure that there's lots of um, all age opportunities rather than um, opportunities where you have to be you know, 18 or above either to play or to attend because of you know, alcohol being present on, on the premises. So um, I work very closely with another team within, um, within the city, which is called the City Experiences Team, and their role is around um, placemaking and activating the city. So um, we work incredibly closely with them to make sure that um, we're doing everything that we can um, to do that. Can I just build on that a little bit and, and say, I want to acknowledge that, um, and as Anne was saying, and Beck Pierce um, can attest to, we, we've got programs and have had for a little while that, that get musicians into nursing homes and hospitals. Um, but what would be amazing is if we use this opportunity that instead of there being programs, they're just the norm. And so in the same way that the City of Adelaide now has a policy that they just employ musicians, it's not a program, it's just a policy. And so I think if we can use this moment in time to, to normalise that rather than have them as special feature programs, that would be a great opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's, there's this great opportunity to codify things, I believe, right now, as we're seeing it's uh, a city wants to set up a music commission, for example, we say, well, turn it into a city policy or an ordinance or a bylaw, codify it so that it has, so that it has staying power, so to speak. So, you know, and, and as well from a, from a city of music perspective, Beck, um, can you give me some, ex uh, some examples of, of how, you how you've engaged um, with, with other city departments uh, and kind of your strategy ar around that? Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of the way that the office has engaged, it's, um, I guess we're more of a facilitator and a connector. So it might be that um, organisations such as South Australia Wellbeing, like a health organisation might come to us and say, we're looking for a particular musician, or we're wanting to highlight um, or work with um, a community that's been affected by bushfires or uh, suicide prevention and they might come to us and um, uh, ask for suggestions of musicians that have worked in that area or could work with that community so it's about connections our, of, our office is about connections and facilitation so um, that's that's one example um, and that's a local example um, Another example uh, in terms of the international connections, um, we have, during COVID, um, we have been connecting with some of our other cities, so 15 um, UNESCO cities to do, um, to be part of, a, of an initiative called We Are Culture. So it's about um, an opportunity for cities to showcase some of their artists during COVID lockdown, and it, that's a program and showcase of music online. So, um, and the benefit of that is for audiences to connect and see live performance in in COVID time. So, a well-being benefit to that. So, um, yeah, I guess they're just a couple of examples internationally at the moment, but from a local perspective, um, connecting with organisations such as um, you know, Wellbeing SA, for example. And I think, uh, no, thank you for that. And I think, you know, some key points to take away here, it's it's all about intentionality really is, is Adelaide has been doing this a lot longer than a lot of, than most cities, I would say nearly 10 years of, uh, of, of this. And I'm sure there were lots of discussions even before that, but clear signposting, um, clear communication between departments 
is what develops, um, you know, a a music policy in a city that, as as we say, it doesn't. We don't get it right all the time, but it enables you to to treat music as just another policy, not a nice to have. It's not just a program over there. It is part of the structural framework of how a city works. And on that note, um, I saw we have a bunch of questions. Uh, please, everyone who's listening, I saw that there were a couple, um, you know, I would say uh, a couple of you have asked two questions, which is great, but that means that a bunch of you haven't asked questions or made comments. So now is the time, uh, but on that note, I'm gonna hand off to uh, my, our partner in crime in this, uh, in this one, Pedro from the Global Leaders Program. Thank you so much, Einan. Yes, we have received quite a few great questions from our audience members. So um, if we get through them and uh, there is a little bit of time before 7 p.m. New York hits, we may decide to end the session early. If there are more questions that come, then we'll address them before that time. So thank you everyone for submitting questions and for staying involved and for bringing your voices to this conversation. Moving to the first question which goes to Beck Bates and comes from Naomi Schroeder in the United States who works at Greater Twin Cities Youth Symphonies and is a member of the 2021 GLP cohort. She asks, in what ways has the work you have described created more jobs for musicians? So thank you for that question. Look, I think, um, well, you could suggest that by um, the, We've provided uh, funding to live music venues um, to present live music for the next six months. So, so what we so usually, just so you know, usually when we provide a grant, it's um, for something that's going to happen in the future. Um, so it's you can never fund anything in retrospect. So, but in acknowledging of the changing times and and how uh, everybody every live music venue's schedule can literally change week to week at the moment. We've um, give like, given like pre-approval, provisional approval for venues um, to have a certain amount of funding over the next six months. And then as they employ musicians, they send us copies of the invoices and we reimburse them for that. So, so while the government's not directly paying the musicians, we're paying the venues to pay musicians. So that helps the venues because that helps them host the live music, but it help, ensures that the musicians, and not only musicians actually, the, the uh, sound engineers and lighting technicians as well. So the, the creative personnel. So that's one way that we do that. Another way is through um, um, funding projects, so projects such as recording projects. Um, and so um, an example might be that people come in and want to apply for a grant to spend three weeks in a studio. And so um, that funding that we give either to the musician or to the studio pays an artist, you know, so to be in there creating work. So there's there's a couple of examples just off the cuff. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Beck. And Next, um, we have two questions for Anne, and I'll ask them both, and then Anne, I'll ask you to respond. The first half comes from Rodolfo Restrepo in Colombia at Universidad Javeriana, and he asks, speaking from the perspective of Western classical music, one challenge we face in Bogota, Colombia, is a lack of economic support for composers and performers, especially working in the space of contemporary music. Could you speak a little bit about how Adelaide which has rich Aboriginal heritage, has navigated the question of balancing support for musicians of diverse backgrounds working in a range of different styles. And then following on this, Eli Rutico in Australia of the University of Melbourne and member of the GLP 2021 cohort, Eli asks, could you tell us about how the city of Adelaide and UNESCO work with indigenous Australians to promote, facilitate their music? Are there policies in place to ensure that funding and support reaches First Nations artists? Um, so I can answer from the city point of view, but um, Beck Bates will, or, or Beck Pierce can talk a bit more about some of the projects that, that have been happening. From a city point of view, um, we really value our, um, our, our heritage. Um, and Argana, Argana heritage um, here in Adelaide. 
Um, we, as part of our policy settings, we always ensure that um, we are encouraging and working with um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait community to um, support them uh, to be part of the music scene. We have um, grants programs that are specifically aimed at enabling their participation and engagement. Um, we also have what we call, um, um, we also have a completely separate plan within the council, which is around um, uh, uh, Aboriginal recognition uh, within the city. Um, so, so we support in that way as well. Um, I think, um, Beck um, Bates, do you want to talk about the um, program that's happening at the moment? Um, yeah, sure, I'm happy to. So look, there's a couple of things, well, there's many things that happen in this space. Uh, so our music development office would offer funding programs to organisations um, that support um, not only our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, musicians and artistic community, but also um, our diverse multicultural um, population that we have here through different programs of different organisations. And we have some extraordinary organisations here in Adelaide um, that do that. And, and well, there's some that um, help with the um, production of shows um, through different um, multicultural groups and present them through their own performance spaces. There are others that have studios that might target different communities to come into the studios to collaborate or to, and sometimes to use music to engage them. So that might not be engaging musicians of that cultural background, but using music to engage community. So it can work both ways um, across different departments in South Australia, government departments I'm talking, we would fund um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander creatives. So through an arts, um, portfolio as well as through um, our innovation skills music development portfolio and and so there are there are a couple of different entry points and programs one thing that I did want to say is that because we have the we have a, a rendition of WOMAD festival here in Adelaide we're very lucky to have that and um, and they've just recently announced the um, the WOMAD Academy for Aboriginal and, and Torres Strait Islanders and multicultural people and it's Fantastic! They're taking ten artists from our First Nations and multicultural communities to take part in a whole in a year program of workshops and activities, and that culminates in a number of artists performing at WOMAD. And WOMAD's the biggest music festival sort of in Adelaide every year, um, over a weekend, and it's it's fantastic. So, so there are mechanisms. What I, one thing I can say, and going back to a question Shane asked, is there is always room for improvement in this area. And so, for many years, for instance. Um, we, we, we would have programs that were open to everybody, but unless you understand how communities engage, you, you can't sit back and wonder why people aren't applying for grants. So you have to actually, to have, you have to change the way you work. And I think there's always room for improvement to make culturally safe spaces and to, um, to allow our, our First Nations Aboriginal people here to, to, be in charge of the programs, create the programs that are relevant and to deliver them within community. And that's something I think we continuously need to improve upon. Yeah. Mm. And Beck uh, Pierce, is there anything else that you would like to expand on that topic? Yeah, look, I just, I guess it, it's quite relevant at the moment because, well, it's always relevant, but um, particularly um, the office is working with another UNESCO city in Auckland, New Zealand, uh, at the moment to facilitate a project with um, uh, South Australian Aboriginal musicians and Maori musicians. So there's an exchange that will take place, um, which is around songwriting and recording. Um, and once again, as Beck has just said, that's led by um, First Nations um, teams on both sides of the city. So that's absolutely important in the work that we do. Um, and you know, we're, we're very encouraging of those sorts of projects to take place, particularly from a cultural point of view, to really showcase and, and highlight um, our music um, here in South Australia. Um, and once again, another program or project that took place a couple of years ago in 2019, which was the year of uh, the UNESCO Year of Indigenous Language, um, we were quite... Um, instrumental in having a significant program as part of 
uh, a showcase that we did here, which was for the Asia Pacific Creative Cities Conference um, that both the City Council and uh, South Africa, the, the government here supported. And that was really showcasing um, and celebrating the Indigenous um, culture here through, through music and having that exchange um, with delegates that came here to, to South Australia, uh, to Adelaide to take part in a conference. So it's, it, we're very mindful and uh, encouraging of those sorts of projects um, to take place within the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. Thank you. I might um, just add one more thing yeah. if that's okay. And that is that we, we have also um, are very uh, keen to make sure that we, we hear Aboriginal language on our streets. So we have a program that we've been working on where I'll, I'll give you an example. In Rundle Mall is one of our is our main shopping centre, and in one of the laneways off that, um, we've we've put the technology in, and we worked with a local um, Aboriginal um, school group um, for them to um, to sing a song in um, in in Ghana, and that song when you enter the laneway. Um, that start, song now starts playing, so you can actually hear the children um, singing um, an Aboriginal song so that the language is present. In another laneway, we're, we are in the process as a city, naming a number of our laneways after uh, famous um, Adelaide-based um, or um, uh, originating artists. So, um, one of the laneways that um, we're working on at the moment is after an Aboriginal group called No Fixed Address. And we've made it, um, it's crucial to us that that goes into a really prominent area in the city. So it's going into one of our main laneways that runs off one of the busiest areas in the city. And so the laneway is being renamed as No Fixed Address, which is the name of the band. And um, Aboriginal artists are, um, are doing an am amazing mural that will also go into the laneway to celebrate that so that it's really important that um, our local culture is upfront and um, in everybody's face, not hidden away. It's so central to what we do. So, you know, those are things that we do. The trouble is that because we're doing them all the, all the time, you know, we, we try to think that that's just part of our normal business. We obviously have to work harder at it, um, but we also try and make sure that it, it is just something that we're always thinking about and doing. Fascinating. Thank you all for sharing all of these projects and your, your thoughts around this, this topic. Um, I'd like to turn now to a question from Eric Booth, um, formerly at the Juilliard School and Lincoln Center of Education and current member of the Global Leaders Program faculty. Eric asks Beck Pierce the following. Do you intentionally use musicians and music teaching artists in expanded ways? Musicians for health, music with aging, music for the climate crisis? Thank you for that question. Um, look, I think um, it's it's becoming more and more important to use mu musicians in those sorts of spaces. Um, uh, not only from a music education point of view, but connecting with those sorts of programs that are in ho hospitals and aged care facilities. One um, program that comes to mind um, is a program through the uh, Adelaide Guitar Festival called Resonance, where mus musicians go into aged care facilities to perform. Um, and that's an opportunity to take the music to those that um, can't um, get out to, to see music and also from a obviously a health and wellbeing um, uh, point of view. Um, and they're very powerful programs uh, and do make a, a, an impact on, on those sorts of people. Um, and also uh, within that program, it's going to other um, facilities where disadvantaged youth might be um, or women's shelters. So it's, it's an opportunity to really connect with um, communities for um, a wellbeing point of view. So yeah, we absolutely, encourage musicians going into those sorts of spaces. Um, um, not only from a performance point of view, being in, in a live performance type of scenario, but through music education, health and wellbeing and, and other sorts of avenues. Great, thank you so much, 
back for for that answer. And this leads to the second to last question that we have for our panel. This one coming from Dan Dubai, a freelance musician in Alberta, Canada, who asks Beck Bates the following. How do you find uh, musicians if you need to employ any for events that you organize? As a follow up, has busking been a part of your strategic plan? So I think actually Anne would be better placed to answer. Um, as the government, we don't directly employ musicians, so um, we will uh, support events and and you know private business if you like that um, like whether they're a festival or a, you know an event themselves or a venue to employ the artists. Um, what I can say is we have a, a music organisation here, like a, a peak body association called Music SA, and they run um, programs where they have, you know, on their staff, they have a music booker, if you like, and they, I don't know if it still runs now in COVID, but they used to book musicians um, to perform in the airport. So as people were leaving the city and arriving, um, there would be local musicians, and they used to do that in various forms, and they had... Um, a mechanism within their industry association where they had a, a register of artists and people could uh, register their interest in being um, considered for one of those gigs. Um, but uh, but Anne from the City Council actually, um, I know they have a busking program and so she might be a better place to answer about that, Anne. Thanks. Um, so we do use Music SA a lot um, for, for booking artists for things like Music on the Streets. Um, but we also do expressions of interest. So we do call outs and we say that we have events happening uh, and we ask musicians to come forward and do that. I think um, one of the things that we have done that's a, probably a, a really interesting thing was that um, as a result of COVID, we actually, over the Christmas period, um, we restructured how we actually present Christmas in the city. It's a very big time for the city around bringing people in to um, activate our commercial areas. And this year, rather than pumping lots of money into decorations and um, marketing and promotion, we actually set up a, um, a Christmas incentive scheme for creatives. So working with businesses and with musicians, so either the business or the musician or the artist could actually put in for a simple grant whereby the business could employ a musician to be playing in their business or an artist to be, to be working in their business or the musician could apply to be working in the street. And so what we did was we put the money to those artists. So there, what we did was we encouraged the, the musicians to come to us and apply for the grant or to work with businesses so that we could build connections between them. That in turn, um, as just as an interesting side point, raises this whole issue that um, many musicians um, are very focused on their music, but they're not necessarily don't have a, a business side to that. So we also run a big program, which is called the Business of Being Creative. And that program is around helping um, musicians and other creatives have an understanding of the business side. So, you know, what do you have to do about marketing? How do you sell yourself? How do you pitch? All of that sort of thing. And I think that's, um, that's um, something that has come even more to the forefront as a re result of COVID. Um, so um, we use a variety of ways. In our libraries, we run what we call residency programs and we ask people and our community to co-create with us. So if you're a musician, you can come to us with an idea and say you'd like to run a program. They pitch it to us, we'll work through it as a partnership and then we'll pay them to deliver that program, um, whether that's a series of musical events or whatever, or whether they want to do some workshops with community, then um, we'll pay them to do that across our libraries and community centers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have one final question that is directed to you as well, Anne. Um, and it comes from Adam Hogan in Ottawa, Canada. Adam, who is interested in the social and community impact of cultural work asks, could you speak a bit more to the ways you have been able to work with other departments or areas of the city and its infrastructure? I'm thinking transportation, public health, parks, et cetera. And as a follow-up, what impacts have you seen as a result? Um, so, we work all the time with all, all, the, all those different areas within the city. 
um, and we trial and test different different things. Um, I think the the results that we see is that wherever we can facilitate music being heard, um, but live music being heard and experienced, we see a benefit in the city. Um, you know, music also plays a, a big part in making a city not only more welcoming and somewhere that people want to come and live, um, but also in making it a safe city. You know, having music on the streets, having people playing music can actually change the atmosphere of what's happening in the city as well. So um, we see we see benefits with that around uh, around music. I think um, we work very closely with with organisations um, such as um, you know um, Access to Arts, which um, works with the disability sector. We also um, are currently working very closely with the Commissioner for Young People around um, around music on on our streets and. Um, how we can have more all age um, gigs happening and things like that. So um, it, it talks the fact that we are always looking to connect and work together and, and to add value to what's already happening and how can we make it simpler and easier for things to happen. So um, I think the advantage is that what we're seeing is that people are um, connecting in with the music and people are actually actively wanting to participate and to work with us um, around this. So can I add? Sorry, yep. um, if you like, I can add to that, Anne. So you know, going going back to our first discussions about you know changing regulatory environment, that was about bringing the police and the EPA around the table. And so so you know, there's a perception sometimes, and not by all, but from some um, regulators that. You know, people come out of a live music venue and they want to fight on the street because they're all drunk or whatever. And there was a there was a link between entertainment and violence. So we did a lot of work about separating that, and 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 part of that is education. And so it's about um, departments coming together with industry to discuss that. And a part of that is getting your transport um, department on board as well. So in the event that there's a nightclub um, where that is happening, you need to get those people out and moving quicker. So there is a, is this, that's called the late night economy, you know, and so it's about how you move people around. So there are mechanisms um, that bring those departments together to look at that kind of solution. Also, um, in terms of infrastructure, I know that the state and, and local governments work together to talk about building codes, you know, and, and what happens when, you know, uh, somebody wants to build a building next to a live music venue. And so that's a global issue we know and and we don't have it perfectly correct you know we don't have it perfect but um but those conversations come together a lot as well so i think uh it's fair to say that wherever possible um we do bring those uh, elements together during COVID, there's obviously been a lot of work with our health department i know that um, we've facilitated roundtable discussions that we've brought industry players together with our health officials and, and our politicians to discuss uh, the implications and the challenges so that they're taken into account when policymakers are considering, you know, what the restrictions um, need to be and, and how that impacts our businesses. So, so that's, um, that's something that's ongoing. And I think Adelaide, we're lucky because we're small enough that we can do that effectively. Beck, thank you. Thank you for jumping in and for expanding that answer. Um, I would like to pass the word back to him before before to ask or add to what has been said. Yeah, you know, I think I would kind of all I'd say is is you know none of this stuff happens by coincidence in Adelaide. These are these are deliberate and intentional policies over a long period of time created and run and developed and tried and tested by not only these three amazing people, but by lots of other amazing people as well. And for a city, you know, and as we've looked at the last kind of four sessions, God, that we've done with this, I think the, the to me, the lesson that comes through this is that music is not just a nice to have in communities. To properly harness the music economy, the music ecosystem, and to produce uh, a framework where musicians are, you know, feel like they have as much an opportunity at their profession and their craft as any other worker in a city. 
requires music to be taken seriously, requires deliberate and intentional policy. This is what's been happening in Adelaide um, and uh, as well as Huntsville and Frutillar, and lots of other cities. And this is where we're headed. Remember, we have to, we have to think about how we can continue to grow our creative economy because this is a renewable resource. Mining what's in our heads is a renewable resource. Mining what's in the ground is not. And cities that are recognizing the types of workforce they want to attract and the types of quality of life that they want to develop are starting to realize how important music is. And I just want to thank you and thank Adelaide and all our partners over all these sessions for exploring this topic with us uh, um, at Sound Diplomacy. Thank you all. Thank you, Anne, Beck, Anne Beck and Shane. Uh, just to echo your words, Shane, um, we couldn't close the session without you know, thanking all of the partners that came together to produce this and to make this possible. Sound Diplomacy, Music City, Community, Solar Management, Cultural Agents Initiative at Harvard, and the doctor class um, also at Harvard Lead Rock Effort Center for Latin American Studies. Coming months, so stay tuned to keep learning from these stories of cities around the world that are working to intentionally develop their music ecosystems. And by doing so, promoting their economic growth and the well being of their people. We look forward to seeing you all in the launching of our next season. Have a evening, morning, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye.